Hello everybody. This is going to be a short introduction into the presentation of transformation of karmic pattern system. Uh, therapeutic methodology that I've been developing for the last 30 or so years. Um, the reason I'm doing this here in Croatia, in Dalmatia, on the uh, beautiful island of Murter, is uh, that uh, we are actually in paradise here. If you look at this wonderful nature, um, the beauty of it, the harmony, and uh, the wonderful feeling that people have when they come here. Uh, what can you conclude but that we are in paradise and that paradise actually exists? It is not something that exists only in the afterlife, in some other realms of existence, but here on Earth. So, the same goes with people. People can be in their original um, paradisiac state or they can go astray and uh, move away from these original natural states. So, the aim of my methodology is to return people back to their source into the norm, because there is such a thing as normal and natural, as opposed to abnormal and not natural. There are such things as natural cosmic laws, and uh, in my opinion every human problem comes from disrespecting the natural laws of the universe. So, uh, I think that uh, the uppermost goal of any kind of therapeutic system is not just to uh, heal the symptoms of a problem. It is not even to heal the causes of the problem, although I've managed to create the methodology that deals with true causes of human problems. But it is to enable people to discover themselves, to return into the original, um, resourceful, optimal, constructive state of mind, and uh, to actually be able to realize their life mission. So, this is what I'm going to talk about in this uh, presentation, which lasts for, I think, two hours or so. Uh, some aspects of this presentation might be demanding for some of you, but I did my best to present you something that I've been uh, investing uh, most of my life. Uh, this is my life's achievement, my life's work, and I hope you will enjoy the presentation and find something of interest and of use in it. Thank you and enjoy the video. About my beginnings, um, this was an outcome, the whole system was an outcome of my meditation practice. Uh, I was interested in, in meditation and in spiritual experiences and so on, ever from, you know, when I was very young and when I was 13 I started uh, meditating, doing transcendental meditation but I, I wasn't satisfied with it uh, because it was a, um, a road that was not direct enough for me. It was an intermediate road using mantras, promising deep spiritual experiences which just didn't happen. So I had to look further and it wasn't un un until I discovered this method done by an uh, American physicist, uh, Charles Berner, who also practiced different kinds of alternative psychotherapy methods. 
that I've had a significant breakthrough into uh, deep spiritual experiences that were genuine, that uh, influenced me very much on every level, that influenced my relationships, my creativity, my life orientation and everything. So uh, this was uh, obvious to everybody that, that, did, that this did something to me. And uh, um, I can say that my life changed for the better in every possible way. Um, and it took me about five years of practicing these retreats with a group of friends to, to reach the so-called stable enlightenment experience. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this a, a little bit later so that you have an idea of what this could be. And uh, as, as, as I reach this level of consciousness, some very mysterious and uh, up to that moment relatively uh, unknown and invisible uh, influences started uh, um, happening and started uh, uh, influencing my, my uh, uh, life in, in, in many different ways. So I soon discovered that um, even being enlightened doesn't mean that you are going to solve all the problems that you have. Uh, on the contrary, some problems that I've had uh, before and I thought I finally solved them and uh, that they are you know, behind me, they, they came back. And many others also uh, uh, appeared reappeared. And the whole group uh, of, of those friends of mine who practiced this methodology had similar <laughs> experience. We soon understood uh, the stories about uh, Zen monks who, when they finally became enlightened, uh, developed something called the sickness of Zen. So they would have, uh, they would be emotionally very unstable. They would start drinking. <laughs> they would go to brothels and start started uh, uh, living promiscuously. They would, uh, some of them even uh, kill themselves doing the harakiri th thing. Uh, so they were suicidal because of uh, something that happened within them. We were not suicidal. <laughs> we were in a much better position uh, because we had some um, methodology to dissolve uh, our emotional problems on the symptomatic level, on the level of symptoms, at least. But we didn't have anything to go uh, deep enough and dissolve the, the, the very causes of the of the. Uh, negativity that, that happened to us. So, I started this quest <laughs> 24 years ago and uh, now I'm here with this uh, uh, relatively complex system with the uh, book one on, on the whole system. Um, which covers the individual limiting influences and the book two is in the making and, and will cover the collective uh, 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 limiting influences. So this is going to be a huge body of work uh, of about almost a thousand pages uh, uh, um, books and around, I don't know how many pages of articles on my web website so far. So, But there is also uh, uh, a very uh, uh, useful practice, and that's what I'm advertising here, <laughs> in a way, and promoting behind it, not just theory. So, um, although uh, the, the existence of inner blockages and inner negativity and uh, the content of subconscious mind that started to come out pouring into the conscious mind 
uh, after uh, meditation and enlightenment experiences. Uh, negativity and problematic situations will not avoid us anyway. Nobody is, is exempt of it. You know, nobody is uh, uh, able to live a problemless life. It seems that uh, in this universe, the existence of problems is basic, <laughs> probably the only constant. Yes, you will have problems, and after you solve them, the new ones will arise. As is very uh, nicely presented in, in the Portia Nelson's autobiography in five short chapters. Portia Nelson is American um, actress. Uh, she also is a writer and did uh, screenplays for musicals and uh, a singer, I think, on Broadway. <laughs> so. Uh, a multi-talented person. And uh, she summed up everything she learned in her life in this autobiography in five short chapters. So let me present you how this autobiography looks like. So chapter one, I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. And it isn't my fault. And it takes me forever to find a way out. So aren't we all like this sometimes? We walk down the street, metaphorically. <laughs> There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. We see it. But we pretend it's not there and we fall in. We're helpless. Immediately we play a victim role. It's not my fault. We reject the responsibility for what we're doing. And because of that, it will definitely take us forever to get out of the hole. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. So <laughs> here she describes the very nature of karmic patterns, and it is that they have this repetitive characteristic. They tend to repeat themselves like broken records. And we are the ones who are doing it, <laughs> definitely. It's not some kind of an outer force that forces us to repeat some pattern. No, it's us. So let's go to chapter three. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there, but I still fall in. It's a habit. Okay, my eyes are open, and I know where I am. It is my fault, and I get out immediately. So, well, she f uh, fell into the hole again because it became a habit for her. But now she's at least able to accept the responsibility for the whole process and, and, and the model of behavior. And uh, that's why she gets out immediately. It's her fault, of course. Who else is it would be? So chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk and I walk around it, finally. So finally there's a breakthrough enabling us, uh, us to go to another level. As it said in the chapter five, I walk down another street, finally. <laughs> 
And this is brilliant to me. I, I, I love this, uh, this poem because uh, everything of important about the problem-solving mechanism is here. Uh, at, at least theoretically. The, the next level would, would be how to implement this theory into practice. And that's what I spent last 25 years on, <laughs> to be able to find the actual practice of, of uh, implementing these uh, uh, ideas. There's another saying, very, very uh, often, and, and when something happen, happens to us in our lives, we use this uh, very, very famous saying, and this is what it is. Shit happens. When something happens which we don't like or interpret as negative, we say shit happens. But uh, uh, yes, <laughs> the nature of the universe in which we live is that shit happened, definitely. Um, it probably happens now in some area of our lives. And I will guarantee you that it will happen again. You might be Buddha, Christ, or I don't know, Sai Baba. Uh, the shit will happen to you again. So this is how we uh, uh, interpret this, this uh, fact <laughs> of shit happening. And uh, yeah, this is a joke, but uh, it uh, wonderfully describes human reactions towards problematic situations. So, Taoism just states, okay, shit happens. Well, okay, so? So what are we going to do about it? Buddhism, if shit happens, it really isn't shit. Yeah, some of us try to solve our problems by, you know, interpreting them as if they don't exist, actually. Zen Buddhism, what is the sound of shit happening? This is a paraphrase of a famous Zen koan, a riddle question used in Zen Buddhism. Uh, what is the sound of one hand clapping? These riddle questions were composed to puzzle the disciple's mind and to uh, uh, direct him to have an experience that goes beyond the dual understanding of universe, beyond process, beyond uh, uh, duality into the world of unity, which is the basic characteristic of, of spiritual worlds. It is the world of unity. Hinduism, this shit is your karma. Well, it might be. You know, some problems that we have might be of karmic nature. So, <laughs> what is going to be the next step? Um, Islam, if shit happens, it's the will of Allah. Yeah, sometimes we try to uh, uh, transfer the responsibility for some problem happening to some, you know, either concrete or abstract outer force. <laughs> it's not us, it's something. You know, it's destiny. Catholicism, here we are. <laughs> this is our territory, in a way. If shit happens, you deserve it. Well, this might be so. This might be so. We attract situations in our lives. That's uh, something that uh, is a fact also. When you go deeper into the structure of human mind, and, and the, 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 the nature of karmic law, yeah, we deserve uh, things we go through somehow. But what is going to be our next step? Protestantism. If shit happens, you need to work harder. You probably didn't work hard enough, so work harder. Well, uh, uh, this is a useful advice but it won't dissolve the causes of shit happening. <laughs> and you need to go into this uh, uh, domain if you want to uh, 
resolve the problematic situation once and for all, if you want to walk and down another street. Lutheran, if shit happens, don't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's our very uh, uh, often reaction that, you know, when, when something bad happens to us, we just tend to sweep it under the carpet and pretend that it's not there by not talking about it. Judaism, why does this shit always happen to us? Some people tend to, yeah, uh, develop this victim-like mentality and present their problems as if, you know, they are, uh, those problems are happening only to them. They are uh, the special kind of sufferers. Well, they might be, but, you know, what are we going to do about it? What is, what is going to be our next step? Jehovah's Witness, <laughs> knock, knock, may we have a moment of your time to explain you why shit happens. <laughs> yeah, there are those people who pretend, who tend to, you know, present themselves as if they know everything and they will uh, uh, force their knowledge onto you because they have the only right version of truth. This one is even funnier. Shit happens Rama Rama Hare Hare in Hare Krishna <laughs> because they use mantras in order to resolve the problems and make the bad spirits or evil go away. And probably the rest of Arianism has the best approach <laughs> to the fact of shit happening. Let's smoke this shit. Yeah, that's what we all do. We either, you know, when, ha we, when we have too much problems, we drink, we smoke, we take drugs. And this might have an effect, at least for those couple of hours when we are under the influence, but it's not going to solve the problematic situation permanently. So this is the transformation of karmic patterns approach. What is this shit trying to teach you? So if we, we, if we take this road, we're on the, you know, our best way to resolving the whole problematic situation. If we are ready to learn from our problems, if we are ready to take responsibility for their origin, and if we are ready to take responsibility for resolving them, and if we are ready to uh, introduce the new kind of discipline into our lives, then we may have a chance here. If not, the shit will happen over and over again. We will go through same problematic situation um, endlessly. So the basic prerequisite for applying this methodology is that you are going to take the responsibility for creating a certain problem and for resolving the, the problem. And you are going to definitely have to take some uh, necessary new forms of discipline. You will, in other words, uh, have to change. Because problems happen to us uh, in order to uh, grow and to learn something from them. Because we are multi-dimensional beings. We are not a car. And this car goes to the car mechanic and the mechanic will exchange some part, put a new one, and you will function as if nothing ever happened. It would be nice <laughs> that things are this way, but we are not mechanical beings only, and we cannot, first of all, expect other people to resolve a problem for us. So the whole healing situation and healing methodology and so on, uh, has its limits here. I'm not against different healing schools. Traditional Chinese medicine is wonderful. 
homeopathy is wonderful, no bad side effects, um, bioenergy, different form of, uh, forms of meditation and so on. But although these methodologies are not causing you much harm or no harm at all, they only address the symptoms. They would uh, uh, try to convince you that they treat the causes, but they don't. And we'll soon be there uh, in the realm of causes and you will see why is this so. And, and the, 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 uh, the causes are relatively simple. The methodology of dealing with causes is not that simple. But <laughs> it's somewhere in between the complex and the uh, simplistic. What would be this real therapy addressing and dissolving the true causes? Um, I didn't go too much into the uh, uh, psychotherapy tradition and so on, although I studied it thoroughly. I didn't study it th uh, academically. My father was a, a doctor and he, and he was a university professor, he was an inventor, he founded a new cathedral. And he had too much academic knowledge, but he wasn't happy at all. <laughs> so I didn't go that road, although I had these roots of uh, being born into uh, a family uh, with a very ambitious doctor. and. Uh, I saw the limitations of, of the official, the academic medicine very early and, and I've been personally poisoned by it very much with, with the drugs uh, the official medicine would give you to treat this or that. Yeah. First of all, you know, first thing you stumble upon when you go into the level of causes is the universal law of karma. Probably the only uh, law in the universe which is absolutely unchangeable, undeniable. So if you do harm to other people or to yourself, what you've done to yourself and to other people will come back to you someday, somehow, in some form, in this way or another in this lifetime or some future lifetime. It will get you. <laughs> Much like, <a>, like taxmen. <laughs> they will get you sooner or later. Um, and the, the, the uh, basic outcome of, of the karmic principle and karmic law, how karma manifests itself in our lives, are the so-called uh, samskaras, meaning uh, impressions and coming from Sanskrit, to be under uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the impulse or the influence of previous impressions. So if, 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 if we uh, encounter a repetitive problematic situation, uh, we may uh, uh, immediately uh, conclude that there might be some karma behind it or some karmic process in action. So, what this karmic law is, the entire universe is ruled by this law, by only one immutable law, the law of karma. It is the law of cause and effect and it is the most important of all natural laws. So everything we do to ourselves, other people, and nature will in the same way come back to us. Imagine the world where the people would respect this simple law. But nobody teaches us this law. Not in schools, not even in Sunday schools, in religious programs. Not enough. They threaten us with God's uh, anger and, and so on. They don't teach us the karmic law. So karma has an internal and an external aspect. It can be changeable and unchangeable. Internal karma consists of these samskaras or karmic impressions 
here called karmic patterns. Their nature is mainly psychological and spiritual, hence the name internal. So these karmic patterns are basically uh, of psychological and spiritual nature. I would add they are also of energetic nature. So they are present as, as programs inscribed in our minds, mostly in our unconscious minds. External <clears throat> karma consists of desirable or undesirable life circumstances, our physical body, our immediate environment, and our relationships. So whatever uh, we experience coming from the outside might be the consequence of our karma. We attracted it for some reason, uh, especially if these uh, circumstances are undesirable or negative or bad. We don't like them for some reason. So changeable karma consists of internal and external karmic patterns which can be changed with conscious activities. This is the uh, uh, extremely important notion here. Uh, meaning, our destinies are changeable if we are willing to work on, on, on changing the uh, internal karmic patterns and external ones also, those we are at the moment able to change, transform and dissolve. But there is also unchangeable karma, which consists of those patterns with, which cannot be changed at the moment. And we may call these uh, patterns destiny. But this destiny is only destiny <laughs> because uh, we might not have uh, the level of consciousness or the re readiness uh, to change uh, required for these patterns to also be changed. But we will one day, sooner or, or later. So karmic patterns are models of feeling, thinking and behavior which limit us in certain ways, but it is possible to transform them into liberating models through conscious effort. Yeah, we can change things if we know their structure, if, if we satisfy the basic uh, rec prerequisite for, for this uh, process, uh, taking responsibility and discipline and so on. Humans are bound to transform the changeable aspect of their negative karma. There is no excuse for the denial of such duty. Meaning, the universe expects us to face our problems actively and solve them. It does not expect us to suffer. Governments expect us to suffer. Uh, um, social structures, some of them, are trying to push us into victim roles. But these structures are man-made, human-made, not God-made. The universe expects from us to grow, to develop. And it is even our duty. Uh, I mean, uh, when, we, when we look at the, the very reason for being born into this body and this planet and this lifetime, it is, among other things, to solve some problems to, and learn from the problem-solving process to experience some limitations, but to overcome them, not to live inside of those limitations forever and complain about them and uh, blame destiny, God, uh, or president for that. So karma is not a means of human torture, but a medium of learning. In India, they would say, uh, this is your karma, you have to suffer for this much time, and when you pay off your debt, you'll be free. No, I wouldn't agree. I would totally disagree with this. Because of the repetitive uh, nature of karma, uh, you may uh, end up paying off some karmic debt over and over and over again. Exa for example, you, are, you owe someone 100 euros but you have a sense of guilt inside of you 
for stealing this 100 euros. And because of the guilt that you carry within you, you pay off this 100 euros you know, every month, each year, over and over and over. While you, at the first place, owe only 100, 100 euros, you may end up you know, uh, spending too much money, energy, on repaying something. And this is absolutely unnecessary. Because uh, suffering does not pay uh, off a karmic debt. You may, you know, torture yourself, punish yourself, and you will do absolutely nothing. Nothing happens. You may do this for tens, uh, 10 years, 20 years, and so on, maybe the whole life, and nothing will happen when it comes to your karmic debt or karmic lesson. Absolutely nothing. But what, what is it that we need to do? If you stole, give back. And teach other people not to steal. Enough. So, internal, changeable karma can be dissolved by revealing its purpose and learning the lesson that, uh, lessons that are hidden behind it. External or temporary unchangeable karma can be dissolved with the opposite positive activity. And uh, we may even uh, proceed with the very structure of, of karmic pattern, which consists of symptoms, causes, and the source. So each karmic pattern has its symptoms, its causes, and the source, uh, its meaning, lesson hidden behind it. Therefore, the process of dissolving a karmic pattern goes in the same order. Because humans have three minds. Psychology knows about it. Only the higher conscious mind might be not that known to different uh, official psychotherapeutic uh, schools. But the, the existence of unconscious mind is now a scientific fact. So the, the symptoms of our problems is within the conscious mind. And uh, the causes are in the subconscious. The meaning, the lesson, or the source of problem uh, is in the superconscious mind. The language of the conscious mind is intellect. So if we try to uh, use intellect to go into the subconscious mind, we will miss the point. Because intellect is not the language of our subconscious mind. There are many uh, intelligent people who say, I will use my intelligence to resolve this situation. I'm smart. Good for you. I have nothing against smart people at all. And uh, intelligence, intelligence is uh, an advantage, definitely. You know. But uh, uh, intellect, words, reason are not the language of the subconscious mind where the causes are, so we need to respect the language of the subconscious mind, which are emotions <laughs> and even physical sensations. And then we definitely need to use the so-called direct experience which is the essence of spiritual experience, to go to the source, to the superconscious mind, and to find the meaning why this shit happened to us in the first place. <laughs> what was the reason behind it? What did the universe uh, 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 read? Our superconscious mind tried to teach us through the whole situation. Because nothing ever goes away until it teaches us what we need to know. Nothing. It will stay here persistently, stubbornly. Sometimes it will kill us. It won't let us get away. And many people die because of some unresolved problematic situation they are within. And it manifested itself through their psyche in the beginning, definitely and came all the way down to the physical reality, destroying their bodies. So, if we, need, if we uh, want to go into the level of the causes, we need to know, first of all, who we are and what our true needs are. That's the 
probably most important thing. We need to have a proper map. We need to know who we are, what are we really motivated by and with, and then we may uh, start revealing the level of the causes. So, uh, yeah, we are physical bodies. We have our physical body. We exist within the material reality, definitely. But we also have our energy body. Uh, psychologists would say we have a psyche uh, which goes beyond the body and the biochemical processes within the body. And only some uh, psychologists accept that there is something beyond the biochemical aspect. Although the very nature of their occupation says, psyche being a Greek word meaning soul. <laughs> so they would be uh, experts for the soul. And some of them told me, uh, what soul? What is this soul you are talking about? The soul is just a concept. It doesn't exist. It's, it's funny when a psychologist, <laughs> an expert on the soul things, claims that there is no thing as, as, as a soul, as, as something that exists independently of the physical aspect of our being. And then there's a spirit. Somebody would call this level of existence God, absolute, the overall cosmic consciousness and so on. Something created this world. Some, therefore, <laughs> there is some force in the universe that is behind it, and this force uh, um, definitely is intelligent. We are not intelligent <laughs> enough <laughs> to understand this force, but it's here. So let's go into dimensions of existence. This is very important and very interesting uh, information. You will not find this uh, very often in, in, in inside the systems uh, of, of healing, uh, also in, in, in the uh, psychotherapy schools, even in the spiritual schools. They tend to mix things up and are not clear enough when it comes to dimensions of existence. And now, yeah, uh, fasten your seat belts, we're <laughs> going to take off, <laughs> because this is really going to be an important information and mind-opening for some of you, maybe even mind-blowing. Okay, we exist... Is there questions? Should we wait the end? Yeah, I would rather w okay. <laughs> let you... Uh, uh, write them down or, or memorize them and ask me a bit later. So the first four dimensions, the physics would recognize that there is such thing as space with its three dimensions, height, depth, length, and time as the fourth dimension. And we exist within, uh, within these uh, 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 dimensions and we have to respect them. For example, if you want to hear this lecture, and you show up here tomorrow at 7 and don't respect the dimension of time, you might miss this information. Maybe nothing <laughs> bad would happen to you besides that. But, you know, disrespecting time may cost you, you know. And disrespecting space also. What happens to us if, you know, there's a, a red light on the crossing and we just stubbornly want to go through the crossing. If we are very lucky, we might survive, but that often does not happen. <laughs> or if we walk down the, the cliff and we go too near the, the, the end of the cliff and, so, and we fall down. We don't respect the dimension of space. We have to respect the space and time. That's how it is so far. Some people claim they have transcended the limitation of, spent, of space and time, uh, but most didn't. <laughs> most of us uh, uh, gain from respecting these dimensions and not from disrespecting them. So what would be 
the fifth dimension, and there is so, such a thing as fifth dimension, and this fifth dimension uh, behaves also like a physical force, although we tend to either, either uh, disrespect it or neglecting it, uh, uh, it totally. NASA has sent this probe into the space, Wil Wilkinson Anisotropy Microwave Probe, and uh, to, to uh, search the nature and the origin of space and, and universe. And this probe came back with certain results. This is what they were. The universe is made of something called dark matter, and dark energy. What the hell is dark matter and dark energy? Dark because we cannot see it with our eyes, only because of that reason, not because it's dark <laughs> or has something with darkness. Um, and look at the percentage. Dark energy is 74%, dark matter is 21%, and normal matter, the one we can perceive with our eyes, only 0.5% uh, altogether, I think. Five. Five. Oh, sorry. But the visible, the visible matter is only 0.5%. So what is this dark matter and dark energy? So this has three basic um, aspects. And I'm going to talk about the first one now being the fifth dimension for me. Some physicists, such as Giuliana Conforta from Italy, uh, have studied the nature of this dark matter and energy, and they claim that only one force, love, links and makes infinite worlds alive. They are not afraid to talk about this invisible energy which holds the planets and, and stars in their places and in their motions. Because the physicists found out that gravitational force is not enough, is not strong enough to keep the planets in their orbits and in their motions and so on and stars in their places. So there had to be uh, uh, an additional force and, and, and a large amount of that force besides the gravitational one. And Giuliano Conforto is not afraid to speak up about that force as being the universal love, mystical love, <laughs> as something we cannot relativize which is even a physical force influencing our lives uh, on every level. And you can uh, actually see that if you look at uh, the children who were raised without the unconditional love, who will even physically look different, sometimes even be a little bit retarded are very much retarded for this reason. I went to school with people from uh, these uh, orphanage, uh, is orphanages, yeah, orphans. And uh, it was visible on the first side who was from the regular family and who was an orphan. Not uh, uh, in the way we dressed, because we all had to wear those uh, blue suits <laughs> to, to be uh, um, all equal, you know. And this universal love also expresses itself through the first energetic layer uh, called the aura. You've heard about the aura and the chakras the energetic uh, um, whirlpools in the aura. So it seems that on the energetic level, on the level of human energy field or 
the aura. We also have an additional organ called uh, the cords, which connects uh, us with other people, those who we are intimate with. There are these cords that go from one chakra to another chakra. And these cords have to exist. Um, they can be either healthy or unhealthy. If they are unhealthy, we cannot make them healthy by cutting them. It would be the same as if we have a, an, an infection on our hand and we, and we try to resolve this infection by putting this hand on the table and taking an X and cutting our hand off. We might survive this, but what would this uh, 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 action make us? An invalid. <laughs> Why not have a healthy hand and transform this uh, ill process into a healthy one using different means, not chopping the head, the hand off. <laughs> In aura, we find uh, seven chakras, and through five of them, we connect to our uh, uh, family, the members of our family, uh, our partners, and our children. <clears throat> aura is in, a, in, in constant motion. Chakras are, are also connected to different layers of aura. There are seven basic layers. And therefore, a large amount of my work consists of relationship transformation. Because if you have bad relationships, and if there's an unconscious structure within your psyche formed when you were, let's say, three years old, this structure would, would stay with you for the rest of your life if you don't transform it. So there are these cords through which we connect ourselves with our uh, uh, family members, uh, sometimes friends, partners, definitely. These cords can be healthy based on unconditional love, or they can be totally unhealthy based on conditional love, producing all kinds of different unwanted symptoms. Like, for example, physical illnesses. And if you don't go there and don't work on this level, uh, you cannot claim that your methodology resolves the very causes of human problems. This is the, probably nowadays in, 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 on this level of, of our global development and so on, the most important aspect of any healing methodology that has an ambition to be uh, uh, capable of dissolving the true causes. That's how healthy connections, cords, would look like, or like this. But this is how unhealthy connections between people uh, who are intimate look like. And they uh, actually cause this, these uh, uh, little pictures within these clouds show the disconnected aspects of our souls, of our psyche, of our identity. That we disconnect in order to stay connected conditionally to other people. For example, you are born inside a family where free expression of emotions was not allowed or was not totally acceptable. In order for you to adapt 
to your family, to, to blend in, to be a perfect member of it, you would probably, very early, start disconnecting a part, an aspect of your soul, who, has, uh, who feels it has natural right, that it is absolutely normal to freely express his or her emotions. And you will lose this part forever. If you don't reintegrate it later on, it will stay disconnected forever. And you would lose many wonderful opportunities in your life, <laughs> which the free exp expression of, of your emotions would bring you. You might have partnership problems, you might have business problem, problems, uh, friendship problems, even creativity problems. So if you block your emotions, how can you be truly creative? The creative energy is being blocked. So we might disconnect or lose uh, many different aspects of our true selves, of our soul, through the process of connecting ourselves with our family members, uh, based on conditional love, which puts conditions. I will accept you if you behave how I like, how I require from you. And I will totally not accept you if you do, if you, if you, uh, I mean, if you don't, if you uh, want to be who you truly are sometimes much different from myself, and this is totally unacceptable for me. You know. These unhealthy connections may look visibly, although you know, we may speak of them as metaphors, but yeah, metaphors can kill you <laughs> if you take them too seriously. So metaphors have a certain existence. They are not totally illusory. They may look like cords, like chains, like some ugly smoke between people. Um, this knowledge comes from uh, Hawaii, from the Hawaiian uh, shamanism uh, called Huna, where the kahunas, the uh, uh, shamans of Hawaii, the, the experts in, in this kind of uh, work, call them aka connections, meaning something sticky, dirty, uh, smelly, and ugly. <laughs> and they consider these connections the most uh, uh, influential when it comes to our, uh, either our health or, you know, uh, our, or our uh, uh, ill health. For example, you would come to a Hawaiian shaman and uh, you would have problem with your liver. And you would expect the shaman to give you something to treat the liver, to drink or to, I don't know. Or maybe to do some energetic healing and, and do something on this level. Yeah. And he would say, okay, go home. Solve your relationship with your mother and then come back to me in six months. And he, he would give you some instructions on how to do that. So it is not only our negative thoughts, our negative emotions that uh, uh, compose the, the, the uh, causes of our problems that are behind our problems, uh, our sicknesses, or, or other kinds of psychological issues. As the newly formed, uh, uh, established uh, uh, methodologists would claim, uh, methodologists would uh, uh, claim, like those who, I don't know, <laughs> there are many of them, I won't name them, <laughs> but there are too many of them. That, would tell you that they treat the causes, although they treat just the symptoms. It, because one negative connection is the source of so many different kinds of symptoms. 
and they would only go away if we transform this connection into a healthy one based on the unconditional love. So how could it be just, you know, anger? It's anger. It's your suppressed anger. But where does this suppressed anger come from? What generates these symptoms inside of us? It is the relationship, the relationship here represented through the nature of our connectedness with the people we are intimate with. Basically our family members and partners. Another example of being uh, uh, connected uh, toxically, as we name this kind of, these connections inside this system. Of course, children are involved in these uh, uh, dynamics, definitely. It causes us to disconnect our original qualities, aspects of our true self, of our true being. So, the uh, uh, methodology that uh, has an ambition to work on the causes definitely has to consist of the reintegration process, returning these true uh, qualities, true aspects of ourselves, and implementing fully into our everyday lives. What actually makes these connections toxic, negative, is uh, mostly the traumatic experience. So you definitely need to go into traumas and know how to dissolve fully and safely the traumatic experience. Within this uh, dynamics, there is the family maps and constel constellations uh, work. The idea is that our perception of our family m uh, members might have a spatial dimension if we pay attention to it, if we allow this dimension to express itself. So there are right and natural positions of our family members in space, and there are wrong ones. <laughs> and these wrong ones might cause a certain amount of problems in, in our lives. And these problems might be probably instantly, sometimes even instantly resolved by just removing those people into their right position. So, five minutes ago, you were inside a pattern that could have stayed with you for the rest of your life. Five minutes later, you're out of it. You're free to go. That's how simple this might be. I will have a little demonstration later. You can all contribute and see for yourself uh, that uh, you might be within some karmic pattern that might be relatively easily resolved. Partnership work also uh, 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 a huge area and very important area of my work. Um, because partners <laughs> will also uh, encounter problems. Um, my assumption is that this will happen uh, sometimes after six months of romantic relationship, of, after being in love, <laughs> where uh, it seemed that nothing could harm this relationship, that everything is rosy and brilliant. Six months up to two years, you are in deep shit with your partner. Why? <laughs> because now that we found love, what are we going to do with it? Uh, uh, it's, it, it is actually a name of uh, the song by this uh, Jamaican group, Third World. Um, partners will have many problems because they will project their unresolved uh, 
subconscious content onto each other. There, there are going to be many transferences happening. And this is going to happen because they actually love each other, <laughs> not because they don't. Because love tends to dig, dig deep into our souls and to heal everything that is not love. Everything we inherited from our families. So we definitely have lots of things to uh, resolve uh, when it comes to being able to uh, establish a high quality partnership, which is actually a mystical thing. You know, it's, what's the true purpose of, of, of partnership? Spiritual development. What is partnership relationship as uh, opposed or compared to family relationships? It is the means of spiritual development. And if you approach it that way, your partnership might stand a chance. If you don't, you may end up in some pattern and stay within it for the rest of your life. The partnership freezes in some traditional model sometimes. You are together because of children, because your parents expect you to stay together, because the society expects you. But then you will have someone, you know, <laughs> else <laughs> as a mistress or a lover, which would satisfy your unsatisfied needs uh, from your original partnership or marriage. There are many methods to transform the lack of communication, inadequate communication within the partnerships. Um, and to uh, uh, educate people on what partnerships actually are, what they could be, and how to get there. So they don't end up like this. <laughs> A very common stereotype when it comes to how people, especially men, <laughs> look at marriage. But to end up like this and, and not end up like this, uh, uh, develop in this direction or in this direction or in this. Okay, let's go to identifications now. The common consequence of, of uh, conditional love within the family are the so-called identifications. Uh, you m have probably heard something about these identifications through the uh, 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 victim role that we often play. And this, these roles, victim role, uh, a role of an immature person or a hero, uh, are learned within our families. For example, a mother is a victim and a father is a tyrant. So in order for us to be intimate with our mothers, we would definitely take on some of her, at least some uh, aspects of her role. And this role will stay with us forever. So here we experience uh, a huge identity loss. In order to satisfy and be intimate with and, and well connected, and we are motivated to be connected with uh, our family members. This cannot be denied. You may try. But this is going to be the fastest way to mental institution or to living under the bridge if we, if, if we cut the cords that bind, if we uh, try to get away from true and healthy connectedness and, and from the transformational work that is required for us in order to reach this. We are motivated to be within relationships because they are the means of expressing uh, the unconditional love 
which is the dimension of our existence, which is a physical force in the universe and cannot be denied. It's here, and it's here to stay. <laughs> you can either accept it or not. If you don't accept it, if you disconnect from your uh, family members uh, psychologically and, and, and actually, this will be the fastest <laughs> way for you to go mad, to lose your mind, to develop some of the well-known mental illnesses, psychosis, like schizophrenia or... So if we lose our true identity through identifications, we accept victim role and we disconnect our true self, our, our true identity, uh, the sense of who we really are. We are going to easily be manipulated by other people. This will be absolutely no problem for them. And we will be their toy. That's what <laughs> the social systems of modern world actually want. They count on that that you will lose your sense of identity and that you will try to compensate for that by, you know, being a good consumer. Listening to what priest says, to what your politician says. Becoming like this. Soulless being. <laughs> Depended on what they wear and what the Vogue magazine says. It's in this winter. <laughs> yeah. So there's a victim identification resolution within the system. There's a dead person identification resolution, which is also relatively unknown aspect of um, family dynamics. For example, when it comes to abortions. Today, probably around 150,000 abortions happened. Today. So what is going to be the consequence of unresolved dead person identification that is uh, uh, probably the first and the most uh, serious uh, uh, outcome of, of abortions. If we make an abortion and if we don't deal with it properly, we may end up being identified with the soul of an aborted baby. And this identification may, may cause us lots of trouble. For example, um, we lose the sense of identity, of who we really are. We become very sensitive, hypersensitive. We have the, the, the attention disorder, ADHD, very common today. One of the reasons for HDAD might, might be this identification. Uh, we may uh, become an addict. Because dead person identified people have a sense of nervousness inside them. So they try to fix this in the way they, you know, can. They might be looking for some drink in order to become uh, peaceful inside of them. They may try drugs. They may end up being a heroin addict. And I would say more than 90% of um, hard drugs addicted people are dead person identified. You have to look into their families, you have to go deep into their families and see what happened there. Is there any aborted soul within the family structure, who is not recognized, given place in the family. And this confusion may cause the dead person identification, which also happens sometimes when 
a family member dies too early, whatever that means, too early, makes suicide 